It's time for yours truly, Jimmy Powers, with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers coming your way once again, transcribed. Grantland Rice, like all writers, like to dream. Today's chapter from The Tumult and Shouting, which I'll narrate in the first person, opens with a poem about dreams which Granny wrote entitled, These Are My Dreams. My dreams are not tomorrow nor yesterday, for yesterday is gone and on its way, and by tomorrow it may be much too late to find my way through darkness and through fate. When you have reached a certain span in life, today is all that counts for fun or strife. The past is blurred with fogs and mists and myth. The future is too brief to bother with. I dream today with no vain, vague regrets for yesterday and all its unpaid debts, with no fear of the future's fading sun, since it may end before this rhyme is done. I dream of romance and a song that rings above the duller elemental things not caring what may happen to skies dark or blue if I can know that just one dream comes true. Having spent 64 of 74 years in the maelstrom of sport, I seem to have spent the vital segment of my life in crowds of 50,000 and 100,000 people. As I look back, the picture is a vast canvas of shouting and tumult, where on many occasions I was seeking a solitude I could call peace. It's been an endless highway of thrills. I look back on countless examples of gameness, smartness, stamina, uphill struggles, and with them, all the varying tides of luck that test human character. Most of the headliners in sport that I've known have been decent humans. Exceedingly few have been dull or stupid. They have all had the proper rhythm, the right angles. What are the most important qualities that should belong to a champion? In no particular order, I found them to be confidence, coordination, concentration, condition, courage at impact, fortitude, stick to determination, stamina, quickness, and speed. To a degree, these ingredients belong to any top flight businessman, doctor, or lawyer, just as they belonged to a Dempsey, Jones, Cobb, or a Ruth. There is also the highly important factor of ability born with a competitor. Yes, and luck, too, is worth cultivating. While I saluted the golden days of the amateur in sport, I've watched the professional take over almost completely. I have a keen sympathy and understanding for those sportsmen whose game must lay midway between the pro and amateur label. It is the rare bird who can hustle a living in today's going and still find time to excel as an amateur. That's why I thrilled with the rest of America when amateur Billy Joe Patton shot everything from an ace to a seven in the 1954 Masters Golf Tourney and finished just a shot off the collective heels of Ben Hogan and Sam Sneed. The fact that Patton played every shot for 72 holes stiff to the pin and let the devil do his worrying was a tonic today's cash register game needed desperately. While sport has been a big part of my life, I must admit that verse has meant even more. Frank Stanton, in his tribute to poetry, gave the answer. Had it not been for thee, life had been drear to me, and all its flowered ways, untraveled and alone, no song in any stream, 
no daisy in a dream, and all that makes life beautiful unknown. Verse and sport together make up the menu perfectly. Nothing else is needed where brain and brawn, heart and ligament are concerned. Rhythm, the main factor in both, is one of the main factors in life itself, for without rhythm, there is a sudden snarl or tangle. It has long been my belief that each of us needs a certain philosophy of life. As for me, I was around 12 when I first discovered Shakespeare. Two years later, I found the brilliantly lighted domains of Keats, Shelley, and Carlyle. I was about 20 when I had full contact with Homer and Rudyard Kipling. While in my teens, I ran across two proverbs or injunctions which have traveled with me ever since. One is from the Bible. Judge not that ye not be judged. The other is from the Koran. Know thyself. Just why they should have had such an appeal at such an age, I'll never know. The first one changed slightly to, Judge not too swiftly, that ye be not judged too swiftly in return. This biblical injunction has served me often down the years. It was an order not to be in too big a hurry to condemn. I discovered also that, Know thyself carried a decisive message. Why spend all your time studying the faults and virtues of others while learning little of what you actually are. Know thyself meant the destruction of self-pity, the end of alibis and excuses, the placing of the blame where it belonged. I learned that good rarely comes from kidding yourself. Another part of my philosophy stems from Ralph Waldo Emerson's self-reliance and compensation. There I learned that often when things are at their worst, brighter days are just beyond. Conversely, when skies are bluest, then is the time to look out for the black clouds. It was a check either way, not to become too optimistic when everything looked good, not to get too low and depressed when everything seemed black. There's an old song entitled, The Life That Loves the Valleys Is Lonely on the Hills. I would certainly be lonely on the hills, and I would always feel at home in the valleys. I'd rather look up to some peak than to be on some peak looking down on those who need help. Of course, those on the peak sometimes need help, too. Often they, in their loneliness, are the more bewildered. They expect a way of life they can't have or a happiness that an unsound philosophy has made impossible. I recall so well the time I read Keats's Endymion and saw this line, Time, that ancient nurse, rocked me to patience. I thought then, here is all the philosophy of life. Human nature is often perverse, which is one reason why it remains so interesting. When arguments develop between square shooters and the chiselers, much of the public drifts to support the chiseler. Winning is important, but to win at any cost, through any form of trickery one can devise, is never worthwhile. While watching every type of record smashed, with more to follow in the briefer time left, I found that all records were made to be broken. Previous marks have fallen with a crash on land, on water, and in the air. Year by year, each record has only been the incentive for another. Today, when anyone sets a new mark, he puts up a sign which reads, There's your new target. If this happens to marks that can be measured or timed, doesn't it apply to the individuals, to ball players, football players, fighters, golfers, and tennis stars? It must. The old-timer looks back on the stars of his youth as much faster, stronger, and better than those of today. I don't agree. There have been ball players in recent years to match all but the exceptions of Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, and Honus Wagner. The Dodgers and Yankees of 1953 and 54 were full of players better than most of the names who played for the 1906 Cubs or the 1910 Athletics. The best doesn't belong to the past. It is with us now, and even better athletes will be with us on ahead. When we arrive at the top athlete, the Jim Thorpe of the year 2000, we should really have something. But by that year, I will have slight interest in what the field has to show. I guess this thought gave me the inspiration to pen the long road. Here is my traveler's cloak, dusty and torn. For half a century it has known the road. Once it was clean and new, now it is frayed and worn. The end is near, beneath a heavy load. But from the valley to the topmost hill, the sky is blue, the birds are singing still. Yes, I have seen my share along the way. Ruth. Jones and Tilden and the mighty Cobb, the fists of Dempsey with their deadly sway, the speed of Owens on the record job, 
And coming on, still driving like the surf, Milburn and Hitchcock ripping up the turf. I've seen my share upon a busy trip. I've looked at Johnson's fastball, outspeed time. I've seen Pete Alexander's deadly whip, and I've seen Natty in his golden prime. But there was Grange, the ghost of super rank, the four horsemen, and Nagurski moving like a tank. One by one, I've watched them march on by. From vanished years, they move across the field. Sarazen, Hagen, Pudge, and Thorpe, and Sy. Lewis and Paddock, decked with sword and shield. The mighty thousands who have done the same to leave this epitaph, he played the game. The long line forms through life's remembered years. The flaming heart, the cold brain and firm command of nerve and sinew blotting out all fears. The will to win beyond the final stand. Now this is Jimmy Powers transcribed and I hope you enjoyed today's story half as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Until next we meet, the best of the bestest.